Okay, we have a, uh, a fairly full lineup uh, tonight, uh, but because we, um, we're going to narrow in on a very specific policy area, I wanted to, to uh, start off with a little bit of background, a little bit of context. Um, so this is my very brief history of uh, U.S. energy policy. Um, like many of the other areas that we've been uh, talking about in the course, energy policy first and foremost uh, marks a collision between, you know, sort of markets and politics or the way in which uh, politics might be asked to intervene to make markets work properly. This included in the case of energy, uh, the, the uh, famous breakup of the Standard Oil Trust, that is the use of antitrust law. Um, we also remember started out in this course talking about the, the importance of the Commerce Clause and of state level policy, particularly prior to the 1930s. And so what amounts to energy policy in the early years of the 20th century are really sort of very short-lived regulatory commissions, the most important of which are in New York and Wisconsin. Uh, finally, you get a little more attention to uh, federal policy with the uh, institution of the Federal Power Commission in 1920 relying again on that one sort of artifact of the Commerce Clause that gives the federal government uh, power, the power the, its authority over watersheds because they cross state lines. Again, as in so many other elements of the course, the, uh, the crux of the policy debate, the sort of linchpin, comes in the 1930s in response to the Great Depression. So here we have uh, a variety of things going on, including uh, uh, elaborate development of, in, of infrastructure, most famously the development of the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, hydroelectric complex, uh, but also including uh, uh, going back into the previous administration, uh, uh, Hoover Dam um, and other uh, hydro uh, development. We also have, remember the New Deal is important for overcoming the dilemmas of federalism. Uh, one example of that in energy policy is the so-called Hot Oil Act of 1935 which prohibited the transit of oil in interstate commerce, that is through pipelines or on trucks, that was uh, pumped uh, in disregard for local uh, regulatory uh, standards. The New Deal also sees uh, a tremendous amount of investment in uh, electrification, uh, particularly to rural, are, rural areas, uh, and more elaborate federal regulation of uh, energy distribution uh, culminating in the Natural Gas Act in 1938. Energy was, uh, and energy policy was remarkable uh, as a policy problem because it really became bound up in national security during the years of World War II and after. Uh, so federal policy is really pushed forward by the Petroleum Administration for War and by the realization that national security and access to uh, plentiful and cheap oil uh, was a crucial element of American foreign policy. And so this is uh, really the driving force between the Atomic Energy Act in 1954, the Interstate Highway Act, which of course is in, is in itself a very important piece of energy policy, is passed in the mid-1950s explicitly as a national security strategy uh, in sort of building domestic infrastructure. And we have the first uh, sort of dramatic collision between American international energy objectives and uh, those of other countries, particularly with the short-lived Iranian nationalization of oil in 1951. Uh, and then, of course, the beginning of a sort of ongoing conflict in the Middle East uh, in which uh, American policy is, you know, from the Six-Day War on, really consistently torn between its support of Israel on the one hand and its desire to maintain stable and cheap oil supplies on the other. We move into uh, more recent decades, a, a couple of things are going on uh, sort of simultaneously. One of which is more elaborate federal regulatory standards, particularly um, Clean Air Act, the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Water Act, uh, which set new standards for you know, the way in which coal is mined, the way in which uh, oil is drilled, and uh, certainly on the emissions side as well. And this is also a period in which uh, energy policy is uh, really dramatically entwined with international policy, particularly surrounding the OPEC oil crisis of the early 1970s. 
And so what we have sort of after the 1970s is, is um, or after the early 1970s, culminating in the National Energy Act of 1978, is uh, an effort um, in part to deregulate what, uh, what had grown up as a sort of set of federal regulations, particularly around energy markets. So that's beginning under the Carter administration and continuing uh, under Reagan. Now, this also marks a period, of course, if we look from the 1970s on, uh, of uh, sort of crisis and volatility in oil markets, which, of course, continues uh, to the present day. Now, what's important for our purposes uh, in, in thinking about policy is not only thinking about policy with respect to sort of uh, individual elements of the, of the uh, energy puzzle, but the relationship between them. Because what uh, energy policy, in effect, is, is a set of policy choices um, which provides uh, incent in incentives and subsidies, uh, regulatory standards that cut across and often treat these different elements uh, of the energy picture uh, differently. Um, and certainly, as we get you know, into the meat of today's discussion, we're going to talk particularly about uh, incentives for uh, alternative fuels. But it's a very complicated uh, market uh, which to regulate. This gives you just the same thing a little more, uh, more recently. So despite all the element of uh, hydro in the 1930s and 40s, it remains a relatively small part, piece of the puzzle, passed by nuclear, you have um, all the other elements in here. And David and the others will, uh, will come back to these uh, and the, the importance of this mix in a little bit. But it's also important to recognize that you know, as we're talking about energy markets, we're talking about, you know, we often think about it in terms of these suppliers, but we also have to think about it in terms of where that energy is flowing. Because, of course, electricity is not a source of energy, it's a consumer of energy that then provides it in turn uh, to residential and industrial uses. So we've got to think about this mix over time and uh, proceeding into the future. And so when we think about energy policies, the basic sort of targets of energy policies are to manage production, which is complicated, to manage distribution, which is very complicated, both domestically and internationally. I mean, think about uh, you know, electrical transmission lines and pipelines, um, all the different sort of both national and local elements of the, the, uh, the energy grid um, and the way in which it's regulated at the national, at the state, and at the local level. We're talking about policies which manage consumption, often uh, through the way in which energy is priced. And of course, increasingly, we're talking about the environmental impact, what economists would call an externality, something outside of actual supply and demand markets, but something that at least since the 1970s, we've paid increased attention to. And again, the policy instruments um, are very widely. And what we want to do today is focused particularly, um, or sort of, sort of come down from all this complexity and fo focus particularly on a set of policies largely focused on the state of Iowa that affect this mix. So we wanted, it's a sort of case study of how different public policies can come together, you know, effectively or, or ineffectively uh, to change the way in which energy is produced, distributed, and consumed.